introduce our speaker. He's Dale C. Meyer, and he is a native of Fort Wayne, Indiana. He took his bachelor's degree at uh, Concordia River Forest and a master's in history at University of Michigan. He retired after working here for 30 years and did a lot of work with the uh, descriptions and things of the papers of Lou Henry Hoover. That was one of his, you know, got his fingerprints all over Mrs. Hoover's book uh, papers and he'd written a biography of Mrs. Hoover that came out several years back. Uh, in retirement, he retired in 2001. He's taught college level courses on topics like the American Revolution, combat experiences of Civil War soldiers, and archival treasures and importance of history. And tonight he'll be talking about an article he's written on the final secrets of the Zimmerman Telegram. And we'll talk about the impact of uh, historians and such like that. So, without further ado, I give you Dale Meyer. Can do this. Uh, that's quite a lot to live up to. <laughs> uh, I can't tell you how happy we are to spend a few days with uh, our West Branch friends and uh, friends in the surrounding cities and towns, and uh, who are uh, very uh, well. You're people who like history, most of you, and. Uh, it's really uh, wonderful for us to have that kind of uh, thing happening. Um, I was especially, uh, I was, a, I was especially. Uh, I was especially uh, looking forward to seeing Dwight Miller and Pat Willenberg, who were. Uh, worked with me side by side for many years. And uh, it was really sad uh, that uh, Pat Wilmenberg died back in June. And uh, I had talked with Pat a month earlier and hoped that he would be here today. Fortunately for me, I can still argue politics over the phone with Dwight Miller and reminisce about our days at the Hoover Library. Stand up, Dwight. I enjoyed working at the library, and I particularly uh, enjoyed uh, working with these two men so many for so many years, and uh, they were just fantastic professional colleagues and best friends as well. And uh, I made some new friends when we retired to Arizona, but I have really missed Pat and, of course, Dwight. When Ruth and I knew that I would be presenting a program on the Zimmerman Note, we thought it would be nice to see old friends and colleagues. It would also be a good opportunity to do something that would bring attention and support to the programs of the Hoover Library and the Library Association, and also the West Branch community, the greater West Branch community, the towns and cities around here and uh, all over the place. Um, <coughs> two things, I think, stood out from our years at West Branch. Ruth and I uh, were really just overwhelmed by the wonderful reception we received from the people of West Branch when we first moved in. And the outstanding school system that prepared our children for successful careers. We never forgot that. And we always continued in conversations with people and, oh, what's it like to live in Iowa? Well, hey, I want to tell you, people in West Branch, Iowa are wonderful people and they are also, uh, it's a great place to raise a family. Well, I decided to write my article on the Zimmerman Telegram uh, because I was convinced that it was undoubtedly the most important event of World War I. Now that's all real lot to say, but I hope by the e evening's end that you will agree that uh, yes, this was certainly important. 
I had not reached that conclusion carelessly, as you might imagine. It was based on the fact that key documents concerning the Zimmerman escapade had been found at the Hoover Presidential Library in the 1970s. Now, that sounds like a lot of a coincidence to me. But, uh, it was just one of those things. You know, if you work uh, at a career and uh, you have good success with that, uh, you, you treasure those kinds of things. I was the Hoover Library's uh, principal archivist for collection management and reference services. Dwight did some of that too, but he was, uh, had other areas that he worked in, and uh, uh, we worked together. And uh, the three of us, Dwight and Pat, and I, uh, we enjoyed so much working with young people and we would ping pong these kids, these graduate students, and uh, when someone would come in and talk to Dwight and say, well, yeah, I know some things, but they also know some more things. Or someone would come in and, uh, uh, and then uh, Pat maybe might uh, take care of the audio-visual things that happen. And uh, it was, uh, just really a wonderful working relationship that we have. Um, the, uh, the situation that, uh, uh, that uh, took place um, really was based on the papers, as I said, of Erwin Boyle Laughlin. And Laughlin was counselor of embassy for the American embassy in London during World War I. And I was uh, uh, the principal archivist for the collection management and reference services, so I knew what was in Laughlin's papers. However, the ethical standards for archivists clearly stated that I could not or should not even think about taking advantage of the opportunity to make some quick money with a newspaper article. Well, when I retired in 2001, the ethical standard no longer applied. And I began to think about uh, maybe writing an article on it. I thought that the National Archives might have some State Department records about this, but several trips to the National Archives didn't produce a thing. Fifteen years later, the centennial celebrations surrounding World War I took place in 2017 through 2019, changed my mind. Uh, I couldn't believe that, you know, there weren't a lot more historians who would have been interested and wanted to pr produce something, and, uh, well, I, I was shocked, and uh, because nothing really important or new had, had appeared. So I felt an obligation to dig deeper. <laughs> but where? I always hoped that graduate students or journalists might show up for a look at Rothman's files. But that never happened during my watch. Most of the researchers who had written about the Zimmerman fiasco had died long before those documents were opened for research at the Hoover Library. Nearly all of the 1919 to 1958 generation of historians conceded that the best book about the Zimmerman episode was written by Barbara Tuchman. And uh, I, uh, I believe that was true then. Uh, that's also why very few, if uh, any, young graduate students ever showed up at the Hoover Library for that kind of research. After a few years, the uh, Zimmerman escapade was really old news. That's why World War, World War I Centennial produced so very little, uh, and if any, fresh insights in regard to the final secrets of the Zimmerman Telegram. Well, uh, I'm going to change mode here, and we will be talking about, uh, for the rest of our time together, um, uh, about the Zimmerman Telegram. I want to tell you that uh, you will receive a full copy of my remarks afterwards, uh, and we will have a little time for some talk about that. <laughs>
The Zimmerman incident was the most important event of World War I. I said that before, I still believe it. But what was so important about this is that it caused the United States to abandon its neutral status to enter the war on the side of England and France. <coughs> Considering its importance, there should have been detailed notes and several cables and State Department files at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., but none were ever found. All I could find were a few skimpy notes and an incomplete first draft of a State Department record uh, that uh, uh, were in, in uh, <coughs> excuse me, State Department report, and this, of course, is the one that was in uh, Laughlin's papers. The author was our number two man, Irvin Boyle Laughlin, counselor to the U.S. Embassy. I found a few clues in Laughlin's personal papers at the Hoover Library, and, uh, well, that was it. Uh, William Reginald Hall, the director of British Naval Intelligence, had enlisted Laughlin's assistance with a with an operation that would unmask the German plan to neutralize America's ability to help England and France. German, German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman's telegram of January 17, 1917, contained instructions to Heinrich von Eckhart. He was Germany's minister to Mexico. Eckhart was instructed to inform the Mexican president of President Carranza, that Germany planned to resume unrestricted submarine warfare against American shipping without warning on February 1st. Eckhart was also instructed to tell Carranza that Germany would be happy to provide Mexico with arms, munitions, and cash inducements of other kinds. If America ever went into war against Germany in that war, and uh, he said, well, why don't you uh, take the opportunity you have here, Gen uh, General and President Carranza, and uh, invade Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, or California. The United States was still neutral until 19, uh, January 7, 1917, but that situation would swiftly change when President Wilson was made aware of the contents of the telegram and called an emergency session of Congress. <clears throat> Zimmerman's arrogant and reckless venturing changed everything and convinced a previous hesit previously hesitant Congress to declare war by a nearly, nearly unanimous vote on April 6th, 1917. <clears throat> When I told my boss, that would have been Herbert at the library, but, uh, he was Tim Walsh, and he was my, uh, he was uh, interested in my meter discovery, and he agreed that I should follow up again at the National Archives during my next Bosch Washington trip. Well, the trip did not produce any State Department documents about the Zimmerman telegram, but the lack of, of a State Department file covering that period only led to my growing sense that the situation was more complicated than would appear on the surface. Trying to unravel the complexities that surrounded the Zimmerman telegram would frustrate the best efforts of historians for the next 40 years. The telegram's final impact on history was felt, this will surprise you, I think, in early June of 1944, the sixth day at Normandy. The impact was a great one. I'm going to talk some more about that later. Uh, no one at that time, and none of uh, most of the historians, didn't realize what, what this meant. The final pieces of the puzzle would not fall into place until this this evening. The Germans never realized what had happened because the deck was clear, cleverly stacked against them by a grand master of deception and intrigue. That happened when Captain Reginald Hall, Director of British Naval Intelligence, 
launched an ingenious disinformation campaign that totally fooled the Germans and everyone else. After several false starts, I had very little to work with. Only one really bizarre thing that happened in 1931. And uh, we'll be uh, getting back to that in a moment. Also, <clears throat> the other thing was Laughlin's incomplete report that none of the historians would ever see. Laughlin's report would eventually lead to the resolution of several mysteries that had puzzled historians and newspaper writers since 1917. Laughlin's final report on the Zimmerman fiasco should have been in the custody of the Hoover Library. It wasn't in the State Department. And uh, uh, the rest of uh, Laughlin's papers uh, were very large, but there was nothing about uh, the uh, Zimmerman thing. However, I decided to give it one last try, and uh, perhaps I'd find something uh, in, that I had missed before, but no such luck. However, I was convinced that such a major event would have produced sizable quantities of files and reports. There should have been something. As you can tell, I was getting a little frustrated. Um, all that my trips confirmed was my suspicion that things were not up on the, on the up and up. In fact, it, uh, in my worst moments, I was, uh, I was uh, really wondering if, you know, well, who's, who stole that stuff? And I, I finally told myself, well, yeah, silly. Between January 2004 and May, 2015, I tried to track down everything that earlier historians, especially Barbara Tupin, had written about the missing final report. As it turns out, none of the other historians ever saw either of Laughlin's reports. There was a, 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 a primary report, and then there was going to be a second one, apparently, at least I hope that it would, because there wasn't much in the first uh, installment. In the early 1970s, Laughlin's papers were still in family custody and would not be donated to the Hoover Presidential Library for several years. Wright uh, is familiar with that, uh, and I eventually uh, was handed that to work with. Um, the papers themselves were processed eventually and open for public inspection, but not until the middle 1990s. By that time, any historians who may have had an interest in the uh, Zimmerman Telegram were almost certainly dead. Those people had been working, you know, on that thing, uh, and they had probably started out as young men at 30 and 40. And by that time, uh, that's an easy statement to make. In the early 1970s, Laughlin's papers were still in family custody and would not be, as I said, donated there for a long time. And in the process of reviewing what earlier historians had written, I became aware of four unusual events, and I was finally going to have a break. The first of these bizarre events occurred just before Admiral Hall's retirement in 1931. That's where that date comes in. And uh, kind of squirrel that away because we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the importance of this. Hall, Admiral Hall at that time was informed that he would not be allowed to publish his memoirs, 1931. That was rather strange, uh, but I also discovered that Hall's memoirs had still not been published when he died in 1943. Now that's carrying a grudge. And that's what it was. It was a grudge event. And that would not be, you know, it just, uh, uh, but it just uh, was un unbelievable. Okay, well, <clears throat> That's event number one and two. 
when Hall's deputy director, William Milhorn, Milborn James, retired in 1944, guess what? He also had to wait until he was fucked. They eventually uh, retired in 1944, but he had to wait until he was eventually allowed to write his memoirs. Yes, but not until 1955. You know, wait a minute. We've got two wars already have gone by. Now, why, why is this so important? Well, uh, that made, I think, number three, and then uh, there uh, also will we'll throw in the fact that James' memoirs, when they were finally published, it did not mention Laughlin's report. Now, what's going on here? That makes for event number four. And this is the thing that kept me going. The convergence of these unusual events suddenly seemed beyond the realm of coincidence. I still did not know what happened to Lawson's final report and the significance of James' memoir being held up until 1955 eluded me at first. Taken together, these events suggested the existence of a, uh, of a pattern in to put it nicely. That pattern made more sense when I examined the uh, sequence of events <coughs> that began with the seizure of a German code manual. I should be, yeah, no. I'm. The seizure of a German code manual by British naval intelligence in Persia in the middle of 1915. I told you this is kind of scrambled at times. Well, so much for the background. And if you take that little sheet of paper, you'll see that you have a, a very abbreviated uh, outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. We've already covered A, and now we're going to talk about B, how German arrogance benefited the Allies. According to Laughlin's draft, or, uh, draft report, he was sitting at his desk when Captain Hall appeared in his office on the morning of January 17, 1917. Because the United States was still a uh, neutral country, the two men had been meeting secretly for some time, usually at Hall's office, but this time was different. In his draft report, Laughlin noted the deviation from the usual routine and explained some of the elaborate precautions that the British and American governments took to protect the manner in which the German message had been handled. The German code had not been broken as the Germans uh, suspected. They, they thought that, uh, yeah, those Americans, <laughs> they just had a lucky day. They, they can't do that again. And the difference between the two things, to decode a, a uh, or to break a code or to have it decoded. And that difference is uh, crucial because breaking into a code was much more difficult and time-consuming. However, decoding could only be done by someone working with a code book or an instruction manual. Yeah, where are we going to get that? Well, what had happened was one of those rare events in which the instruction manual for an enemy's code system is either lost or what does that leave us? Stolen. And that's what did happen. In this case, the British had seized a code book and instruction manual that was concealed in the personal effects of William Osmus, the German Vice Consul General at Bushiri on the south coast of Iran, or Persia as it was then known. And Osmus, though, was not a diplomat more complexity. He was a spy. His mission was to disrupt the flow of oil over the Anglo-Persian pipeline. When he arrived in Persia, Persia around April 1915, he tried to recruit local tribesmen for a jihad. Yeah, they had a man. And the British were a good target. Uh, however, uh, the fellow that he had approached uh, happened to be loyal to Britain. And so the tribal chief arrested him, sent for the British, 
but Vasmus escaped before the British agents arrived to take him into custody. In the confusion, Vasmus said, leave his luggage behind. He flew to the provincial capital, or he fled to the provincial capital at Shiraz, and made several outraged protests to have his luggage returned. In the meanwhile, the British had seized all of Vosmus's files in a raid on the German consulate in Bushaira. The files left no doubt as to what Vosmus was up to, but he continued to rant and rave over the loss of his luggage. The British head of the Persia station ignored his protests and uh, he wanted to get rid of it, and so he sent it all back to London where it stayed for several months. Admiral Hall heard about Vosmus' exploits several months later when a wounded British naval officer in Persia came home on a convalescent leave. He'd been wounded, and they sent him back so he'd get better help. Well, he went to uh, visit his friends in London, <clears throat> and they asked him, well, do you know any good war stories? And he did. And <clears throat> he laughed, told them, everyone in Persia had gotten a big laugh over Vosmos's indignant demands to recover his messages. Admiral Hall sitting there and his antenna just went up. They had the man's files, they talked to the tribal chief. Why had he made such a fuss over a shaving kit and dirty laundry? You can pretty well fill in the blanks for yourself. <laughs> Hall ordered the luggage brought to his office, and there, when the suitcase was opened, was Vosmus's copy of the German Diplomatic Code Corps code book. Open sesame, indeed. The operating manual allowed Hall's staff to read messages from the German Foreign Ministry uh, and uh, also uh, all of its diplomats and spies throughout the entire world, including those that were sent to the German em Embassy in Washington, D.C. British naval intelligence had routinely intercepted German messages, but until then, British intelligence had not found a way to crack the code. Hall found it especially interesting, interesting to see how the Germans had been able to deceive Woodrow Wilson. This thing just kind of snowballs and adds new elements to it. Uh, Hall realized that uh, Wilson would uh, uh, really respond to that. Uh, <coughs> Wilson uh, had been uh, had been uh, working with the Germans because uh, uh, the Germans were trying to keep him from realizing that the Germans weren't, weren't really interested in the peaceful end of the war. The uh, of that diplomatic offensive had been especially effective because Wilson was an idealist and he wanted to believe all these German lies. At first, Hall did not share his triumph with any of his superiors in naval intelligence, but the British Foreign Ministry <coughs> or his friend Laughlin at the embassy. When conducting foreign policy, Wilson believed in turning the other cheek but he was also known to possess a particularly prickly personality. And uh, what uh, the columnist George Will once referred to as characteristic tantrums. If you're getting this, uh, if you're getting this, uh, Wilson uh, was really angry. Final moment finally came six months later with the intercept of the telegram. 
Lawson's account confirms that date, adds a few important details that were not available to historians in the 1950s. And Laughlin claimed in his draft report that Hall had come to see him that same day and that he immediately took Hall in to see Walter Hines Page, the American ambassador. After he had read Zimmerman's telegram, Page asked Hall for permission to send it to Washington. Well, that was exactly what Hall wanted. He'd been waiting for this thing. And according to Laughlin, uh, this thing was then sent to the, to the president who claimed, I'm quoting now, uh, who <clears throat> seemed to grasp its importance fully while would, wishing to be informed of all details touching it and requiring every sort of verification. Barbara, Tuch Barbara Tuchman received a Pulitzer for her, her fine account, but it was incomplete because several important sources were not available to her. She did not have full access to Laughlin's draft report in the 1950s. They were still in the custody of Laughlin, <coughs> uh, the, fam the Laughlin family at uh, that point. Noborn James was finally allowed to publish his memoirs, but it was too late to be of much assistance to Barbara Tuchman. Uh, Noborn James and uh, Dr. Uh, Tuchman both had books that came out at the same time. The Germans had done something very unusual. They had sent the telegram by three different uh, chan roundabout channels so as to uh, ensure its safe arrival. And this is the thing going to uh, uh, the Mexican president. And <clears throat> Hall's elaborate scheme involved having American officials obtain a microfilm copy of the encrypted uh, tele tele telegram from the uh, Western Union office in Washington, D.C., and then sending a copy of that to the American Embassy in London. Well, they had that. What's going on? Once it arrived, Hall's chief code breaker brought the Vosmoos code book to the embassy, where he helped Laughlin's assistant, a man by the name of Edwin Price Bell, to decode the message. Well, that complicated little song and dance gave Wilson an excuse to do something he'd been wanting to do for quite a while, and that was to announce that the telegram had been broken on American soil. Wait a minute. Edward Price Bell worked in London. Oh yes, the American embassy was considered American soil. Those uh, diplomats, you know, watch them. The whole reason for that complicated song and dance was that uh, they gave Wilson an excuse. And also, the idea was to make it appear to the Germans that the Americans had just gotten lucky and their code breakers had had a good afternoon and they, they broke it. That's not what happened. And the reason for using the telegram that passed through Washington was that Hall knew that it contained several typographical errors that were not found in the messages that had passed along through the other routes. These messages were intended to eliminate any suspicion that British agents were anyhow involved. Now, if they did that, they might have gotten suspicious. They might have said, hey, didn't we have a guy named Vosmus and he never showed up again? <coughs> And what's that all about? And so uh, this is uh, something that uh, is critical to our story. Because the Germans believed that version of the story, they didn't bother to change their codes. They never changed their codes. I mean, literally. Not in 1990, not in 2000. They never did. It, only, it was only much later, after World War II, and that the American allies would finally agree that, yeah, we can release that stuff. It's, old, it's an old story now. 
Well, in their arrogance, the Germans convinced themselves that the Americans had caught a lucky break, nothing more. Zimmerman himself had arrogantly admitted writing a telegram. I don't know what possessed him to do that, but he did. He would, oh well, I guess he was just so proud of that that he did it. Uh, that removed any doubts as to the note's authenticity and it greatly inflamed public opinion. And that uh, winds up, as we've seen, uh, in America coming into the war. Wilson had begun to recognize the difficulty of remaining neutral and may have welcomed an opportunity to lead the war into uh, the country into war. Public sentiment in the Western uh, states. Now this is a story that isn't often told. That Western states had been staunchly neutral. They supported Wilson until they were confronted with the possibility of Mexican invasions passing through their backyard. And that is what caused uh, uh, Wilson to ask for a declaration of war. And as I, I, as I said earlier, it passed through both houses almost unanimously. I mean small votes. I think the best vote was when probably in the Senate, and it probably was something like uh, 27 to 200 and some. Two, I think it's 260. And uh, so <coughs> this uh, then you know, changes a lot of things. Um, <coughs> It produced a dramatic switch in public opinion, and that leads us then to uh, how the Americans rescued the Allies. That's point C if you're trying to follow just along with your little outline. How oh, Americans rescued the Allies along the war, that needs some uh, uh, discussion too, but we don't have time for it. But, uh, it's a long story about how poor the, uh, poorly the British and French had <coughs> tried to win the war. John Pershing was still uh, well aware that he had inherited an incredible mess from the Allied generals that was unprecedented in the history of, mo of you know, modern ancient his history. Historian John Moser tells it this way. The behavior of the Allied generals at this time suggests men more afraid that the Americans would beat the Germans than that the Germans would win the war. That's kind of strange thinking. And if the rest of you can uh, explain that to me afterwards, well, maybe I'll finally understand it too. But it's a really weird way of thinking. And that was the French position. <clears throat> well. Pershing must have wondered about that, too. At that point, he must have felt like the fellow who remarked that, I'm pretty smart myself, but I got a lot of dumb help. Uh, the dumb help being the British and French generals. Fortunately, Pershing had received some crucial help from Irvin Laughlin, Admiral Hall, and British Naval Intelligence generally. And uh, Pershing just knew just how to put British uh, intelligence Information, information to good use, and it paid off handsomely. He was getting a lot of good intelligence. He moved quickly from uh, to uh, form a plan and move his troops into position. He also made it clear to the British and French generals that they should not think they were going to steal American regiments to fill in the gaps in their dwindling ranks. Pershing was well aware of the general's incompetence and knew that his men would have been sacrificed literally on an altar of French stupidity. His men, on the other hand, had been trained and were eager to finish off the Germans. More eager under the circumstances, these are these ill boys, our guys, they were more eager under the circumstances than they probably should have been, but they didn't know any better. They believed that Pershing could win the war, they loved him and they trusted him, and Pershing was confident too. He had been given a really interesting, well, his choice of places to uh, attack the Germans. He had been given the far eastern line of the German line. 
and your two armies are facing each other. You have the Germans here, and they're facing more or less that way, and here comes Pershing, and they're at that side. And uh, an attack on the end of that line would have meant that the Germans could have snuck in Pers behind Pershing, and that would have been dangerous, very dangerous. Um, particularly because at that moment, the German forces outnumbered the Americans. Well, the Americans were reinforced and reinforced and reinforced, and uh, pretty soon uh, Pershing was uh, ready. Uh, he fully intended to attack in the middle of the line. Now, I'm not a real good tactician, but what you're having, having is uh, Pershing being surrounded completely. Well, John Mosier helps us a little bit with that, and uh, Mosier uh, was very impressed when he wrote later on, I think it was in the 1980s or 90s, and what, here's what he had to say. Psychologically, the offensive for the Americans was important, and it would show the Americans that they could operate successfully where the French had failed, ease the black mark off the French record, you know, that's just to make the French to feel good, and shake the defending Germans. The most important goal of Pershing's plan was to sever the rail lines that allowed the Germans to shuttle their troops back and forth behind the front lines. And that uh, gave them a tremendous advantage. They could sh shift those troops wherever they wanted them. If those connections were severed, the German army would not be able to sustain its troops in the field. Pershing knew that. He was counting on it. Things could go wrong, but Pershing had been extremely, well, happy over some intelligence reports that he was getting from Admiral Hall, Erwin Laughlin, and uh, British Naval Intelligence. And uh, <clears throat> included in these reports were two particularly welcome bits of evidence. If Pershing's plan worked, the German system would be so critical, it would be, uh, it would just collapse. If Pershing's plan worked, the end of the war would be only a matter of time. Reinforcing that cheerful possibility was the fact, uh, but what this was forward from uh, London, courtesy of British Naval Intelligence and Company, uh, that the German ar armies, as a result, had suffered heavy casualties, and that was a new thing for the German armies. They don't have people deserting, and that's what happened. So Pershing knew where they were, how many there were, how, how many sick ones they had, how many wounded they had, and uh, that uh, made it possible for, to, uh, for Pershing to do what all the other generals had failed to do. All that Pershing really needed yet was uh, some stout-hearted men. Fortunately, there were plenty of them right outside his door. But that's that bunch of young Americans, and they just couldn't wait to get at the Germans. Um, one of the young men who uh, was part of that was a young lieutenant from Iowa by the name of uh, Hanford McNider. And uh, McNider and hundreds like him saw to it that Pershing's plans were highly successful and they did everything they could to make it uh, achievable. After several additional months, the, the German army and navy surrendered and Kaiser Wilhelm had uh, fled the country. The war was over and an armistice commission met in Paris to work out details of a peace treaty. <clears throat> Those who survived the war usually went straight home to take their places in their communities and they were uh, almost universally met by a, a bunch of happy friends and uh, family members and uh, maybe a few young ladies. And uh, they were just overwhelmed 
and they became a new generation of young women and men. And by the end of the war, a recently promoted Colonel McNider, not a lieutenant anymore, would emerge as one of the greatest heroes of World War I and World War II, and I would say Korea too, or any one since. Um, I will give you some uh, inkling of what he, what he did. Uh, during the interwar years, that's after World War II, he continued to promote the best interests of the peacetime army in several very highly innovative and effective ways. First as the founder and first president of the American Legion, and then, well, there was a job that came to Luke, and they said, well, you know, I think I ought to stay here and see what I can do for my guys uh, in the American Legion. And uh, finally, they came up with an, uh, an office that he could uh, pass, down, pass up. Uh, you don't say no to the Assistant Secretary of War, and that was his new job. Um, when America went, to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when America went to war again in 1941, he commanded the legendary Bushmaster uh, Regimenta, <coughs> Regimental Combat Teams in New, in New Guinea, and with great success, and he, he ranked he uh, rose to the rank. He was not a colonel anymore. He was a lieutenant general. And uh, the number of... Uh, when you get your... Uh, the uh, <coughs> booklet, you're going to, uh, I think, uh, find out a lot more about this man if you want to. And uh, there are actually about two and a half pages of his accomplishments. And he uh, had several bronze stars, several silver stars, several DSCs, and he was nominated for the, uh, uh, he was nominated for uh, the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. Nobody has t t touched that. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, have a change of pace here. We're up to D now. Disasters averted, loose ends tied up, final surprises explained. I think you're entitled to some of that. This is where we try to make some sense out of all of this. Do you think you're uh, sufficiently, uh, <laughs> uh, sufficiently um, having a hard time with this? <laughs> I hope that it's uh, been something that uh, you will uh, be able to uh, take along home with you. German failure to change their codes allowed the Allies to continue to read several German codes <coughs> until <coughs> the end of World War I and throughout World War I and II. This was a tremendous advantage for the British American cause, but the full impact of the Allied intelligence coup would never be known, you know, are knowing it now. It's time to tie up some loose ends. And that's the purpose of this <coughs> section D. Well, first we have the fact that the British and American intelligence agencies, such as the Office of Strategic Services, had maintained restrictions that were later imposed on, uh, on the Hall, <coughs> and James' memoir, memoirs during after the war and into the early years of the Cold War. The obvious reason is why did they then do that and how did they make it work? The simple answer is those wise old men in British naval intelligence didn't trust the Germans. The full explanation is more complex, of course. The German nation had been treated harshly after World War I by the Treaty of Versailles and were outspokenly opposed to those terms. They had been forced to pay a huge sum for reparations and war debts that the Americans had uh, uh, laid claim to. And they were also vehemently opposed to the restrictions placed on the German Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, <clears throat> there were only a few claims. <coughs> 
They didn't have any tanks. They had to go over to the Russians to get tank uh, training. The uh, German army went for several million down to about 150,000. And that, that made uh, anybody fighting mad. And the Germans were obviously spoiling for a fight, so it's no wonder that the Allies believed that there was value in concealing their tricks of the espionage tr trade. Uh, the British were 100% right about that, as it turned out. Um, and uh, <coughs> they were 100% with respect to World War II. And again, they hung on to those secrets. However, there is also a new threat on the horizon by about 1949, 50, 52, 54. The answer to these questions is extremely important. German intelligence might have found it very instructive if they had known they had been how, how they had been hoodwinked by the British and Americans. If the Germans had known that the British had seized Vosmus files and code manual, they almost certainly would have taken greater care in the future to physically train, protect their code books and their incredible Enigma code machines. Well, the Germans were not stupid, but they had never uh, realized that uh, they had never gotten those uh, Enigma machines back. And they would have realized, if they'd thought about uh, Vosmus and his, the problems he produced, they uh, probably would have uh, taken a little different look at things. That certainly would have changed uh, the playing field dramatically. As we shall see, German overconfidence would have devastating effects. And here we have the story. Historian Williams <coughs> Williamson Murray. I have an awful time with this man's name because at first I thought we were talking about Murray Williamson, but no, it's the other way around. Historian Williamson Murray, writing in the spring 2010 issue of Military Historic Quarterly, claimed that the Germans were in, this is quoting him, were incredibly sloppy in the field of intelligence and communications security and held their opponents in contempt in those fields. Okay, and the quote uh, included in that were the, the Polish were the Polish army and scientists. More about that in a moment. Uh, these foolish held it attitudes led the Germans to maintain their arrogant delusion that the Enigma system could not be broken. Well, it had been broken long before the end of World War II. And the thing that really uh, was hard to uh, believe is that the Germans uh, did not conduct a similar counter-espionage effort of their, own, of their own. They didn't need that, except against the British and later on the Americans. But, you know, the French and the, all the rest of the uh, people who tried to to oust Hitler. Uh, well, all of that enabled the Polish scientists to steal several, not just one or two, but probably up to a dozen of these Enigma machines and turn them over to the British. Now, if the Germans had known what was happening, I think they would have had a, a mass heart attack. The impact on the course of World War II would have been disastrous. Without the information achieved from the enigmas, the British could never have carried out the most elaborate deception plan in the history of warfare. Now that's, you know, been written up several times in different books, and that is just incredible. But if that got shut down, what would have been the effect? Well. The Germans almost certainly would have recognized they'd been fooled and they would have installed security measures and done stuff they should have done a long time ago. Uh, all of it to protect their 
Enigma code machines. The impact of the, on the World War II would have been disastrous. Without the information obtained from the Enigmas, the British could never have carried out the most elaborate deception plan in the history of warfare. And that would have been totally, irretrievably doomed the Normandy landings on June 6th.